Uh, but today I'm going to talk about engineering microbes for producing fuels. And uh, rather than start off with the standard talk that I usually give about uh, where cellulose comes from, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, how we do engineering in other disciplines and then segue into how we do engineering for biology. So uh, let's imagine that you wanted to uh, engineer a system, let's say a computer that would allow you to communicate with your colleagues, write papers, and even present PowerPoint. Uh, if you were building that computer, if you wanted to build one at home, you'd build it from off-the-shelf components, things like sound cards and hard drives and, uh, of course, a silicon wafer that would operate uh, the system and in, in, in an operating system on top of that. And if you're the maker of those components, you would sell those components to places like Radio Shack, so that if your hard drive goes out, you could just replace it on your computer with another hard drive. And you wouldn't have to worry about the composition of that hard drive. All you'd have to worry about is the connection and making sure you had the right type of hard drive. And of course, if you're a maker of those components, you can sell them to the makers of these boxes. So uh, Apple doesn't actually make hardly any of the components in here. Uh, it, they're made by other manufacturers. I did notice, by the way, that uh, the new iPad coming out, Apple is manufacturing uh, the chip inside it. But save for those uh, specialty applications, this box, uh, all the components in it are made by manufacturers of those components. And of course, we have something so inexpensive like this computer uh, and that is so functional because there's a whole knowledge base that underlies uh, microelectronics, characterization of components, standardization of components, so the, the connections on this computer are all standardized. Uh, we have independent devices so that they supply enough power in this device so that when you turn one device on, it doesn't shut down another device or dim the screen. We have models for design and debugging, and of course, we've got the ability to manufacture components that we need. Let's take another industry. This is the chemicals industry, and the example here is styrene, which is one of the largest quantity bulk chemicals produced. If you wanted to make styrene, of course, you'd build a chemical synthesis factory to do that. And you would do so using off-the-shelf components, not quite off-the-shelf, but things in chemical engineering that we call unit operations, components that function independently and can be plugged and played together. And of course, we have this industry because of a knowledge base, a knowledge base of how to produce styrene from coal, a knowledge base of how to design and build reactors if you don't have exactly the right one, and standard connections, like the standard connections on a pipe. You never have to worry when you go to the hardware store about getting pipe from the same manufacturer as you have in your house. All you have to do is worry about the size. Everything else is taken care of. So what we have in these disciplines are parts and devices that are independent and characterized. We have standards both in the connections and the characterization. We have the ability to design and fabricate those components. Let's take another industry, the industry that I'm going to talk about today, uh, the biotech industry. And let's say that we wanted to try to solve this problem of global warming by producing advanced biofuels from cellulosic biomass. Well, one thing we could do is just resort to the biofuels that nature gave us. After all, we've been perfecting the production of ethanol for centuries as humans. Uh, it's produced by yeast. Uh, it's produced at about 20% in the fermentations. Um, it doesn't have the full fuel value of gasoline, so you can get about two-thirds of the miles on a gallon of ethanol that you could on a gallon of gasoline, provided you have a flex fuel car. Because it's poisonous to the yeast, it's only produced at 20%, and you have to distill it out of the uh, fermentation broth, which means you add a lot of heat, and therefore a lot of energy, and therefore a big cost. And because it's corrosive to pipelines, we can't transport it using traditional means. We can't transport it using pipelines. We have to transport it using trucks uh, and rail cars. Uh, so it has a number of challenges. I like to say that ethanol is better for drinking than for driving. <laughs> so if not ethanol, what then? Well, there are many factors that we might want to consider if we're producing a fuel. We want to 
build an organism that will produce a fuel that will fit within our transportation infrastructure. We have about three trillion dollars worth of transportation infrastructure if you consider automobiles and pipelines and gas stations and everything else that would have to be replaced to uh, use ethanol. What about if we replace the biology and build the fuel that will fit within that transportation infrastructure? What kind of fuel would we want to produce? Well, we'd have to consider the engine type. We've got gasoline engines, we've got diesel engines, we've got jet engines among the types of engines. Uh, it has to have a high energy content, so the consumer cares if they can get two-thirds of the miles on a gallon of fuel. Uh, it's got to have a good combustion quality. Um, it can't be too cloudy. People don't like cloudy things. They like clear things. It can't be too volatile, but yet it's got to be volatile enough that it can uh, burn in your engine. Uh, it's got to be stable so that we can pipe it and store it. It can't smell too much because people don't like smelly things. Of course, it can't be toxic because it's going to leak out of uh, gas tanks. It's going to leak out of filling stations. Uh, can't be too miscible with water because therefore it's going to pick up water in pipelines. And it can't be $4,000 a gallon. So here are some possibilities. And uh, these are possibilities based on the fuels that we have now. What we'd really like to do is engineer the biology to produce fuels that are identical to the fuels that we're getting from petroleum. Now, we could produce some medium chain alcohols. Of course, these have higher fuel value than ethanol, but they also have the problem that they're extremely toxic to the producer. What we'd really like to have are branch chain alkanes, for instance, like we get in diesel and gasoline and jet fuel. So diesel has a lot of these long chain, straight chain alkanes. They're great because they have very high energy density. But you have to have a branch or two in them so that they don't freeze in places like Minnesota in the winter. Of course, we could produce esters. And these are already potentially uh, great biodiesels. Um, and we can produce these in small quantities from plant oils. But they're very limited in the types that we can produce. And we can't move the ester bond uh, anywhere we want in the molecule. And of course, we'd also like to have jet fuels. And there are some great cyclic molecules that could be potential jet fuels. So we need to produce a variety of different hydrocarbons. Now, fortunately for us, nature has given us a number of metabolic pathways. So this is central metabolism and decorated on that. I've got various types of molecules that we can produce that might be good biofuels. And, and those are shown in red. And while you might not be able to read those, you should just note that there are a lot of potential fuels. M not many of these are natural. And therefore, we're going to have to engineer hosts to produce these. Now, uh, if you wanted to build a microbe, a chemical factory, to produce these biofuels, uh, you're going to need a lot of off-the-shelf components. You're going to need a chassis a power supply, if you will, to put those genes into. Um, in our case, we use yeast and E. coli. But for industrial purposes, you're probably going to need an industrial strain of yeast or a better microbe than E. coli. And then you're going to need all of the components. And some of these components are pretty extensive. Uh, in the case of the artemisinin biosynthesis for the antimalarial drug, we needed about 40 components to engineer the cell. Now, fortunately, uh, or unfortunately, there's no BioShack to go to to get those components. So where do we get our biological components? Well, places like JGI. Uh, they sequence genomes, and you're going to hear a lot about that uh, over uh, the next couple of days. And that gives us a great natural parts list. But none of those parts are characterized. And none of those parts have standards. So using them interchangeably in microbes to produce various hydrocarbons is really a difficult task. Now, the other place we get our components is we write our colleagues, because we all publish papers on components. And we send them email saying, please send me the device you described in your paper. And when you get around to it, you answer the email. At least those of us who are good citizens answer the email. and. We send the device, the biological device, usually as a stab or as a colony struck out on a plate or as DNA, in a tube. And we send them this device. We say, the device you requested is in this package. Please use it exactly. 
as we described in our paper. Your assistant sends it off, you think you're done with it. A few months later, you get another email saying, eh, it didn't work. <laughs> so you send back another email, well, in my hands, it worked this way. Please try again. Can you imagine where we would be in, this in the microelectronics industry if they behaved like we do in the biotechnology industry? We wouldn't have this inexpensive, highly functional device on our desktop. But this is how biotechnology operates right now. Now, we need to build this advanced biofuel and this microbe that will produce it. And that means we need hundreds of components to do so. Well, fortunately for us, we started this work uh, on biofuels, piggybacking on the back of another project to produce a hydrocarbon, in this case, a hydrocarbon that treats malaria. So we could start with a microbe that was fairly souped up for this process. And this, again, is one of the benefits of synthetic biology, being able to reuse components or large systems that you've built for other purposes. And in this case, it's a matter of substituting hydrocarbon biosynthetic pathways, shorter chain hydrocarbon biosynthetic pathways for those that produced artemisinin. Now, uh, I just want to briefly talk about some of the background for producing hydrocarbon, and I'm going to refer back and forth to the artemisinin story. Um, for those of you who've heard it, I apologize, um, but there are some important lessons from this. Um, as we uh, go through designing microbes to produce advanced biofuels. Now, the first step in the artemisinin biosynthesis was actually to produce a hydrocarbon that is about the molecular weight of diesel fuel and uh, jet fuel called amorphodyne. Now, the gene for this had been cloned from this plant, Artemisia annua, um, and it had even been described in a patent and in a paper, and so we requested uh, the uh, gene that encodes this enzyme. Um, from the person who had done it, and he said, no, you're my competitor, I'm not sending it to you. <laughs> this is the other problem with biotechnology is that people can get away with this. So uh, we actually, rather than produce that molecule, we wrote to a different uh, colleague and asked for a different uh, part, in this case, a part that encodes that 5 epiuristolokine synthase, produces a similar molecule. Fortunately, he sent it to us, we put it into our microbe and it behaved absolutely miserably. Um, and the top here is a gram per liter and we're six orders of magnitude away from that. Um, so rather than uh, try to report our colleague to the journal he had published it in and force him to send us the component we wanted, we actually went through and synthesized the gene. This was back many years ago. Uh, and now, of course, you can just order out. But the, the advantage in doing this is that you can take a gene that would normally encode a plant gene and may have rare codons in it, be poorly expressed in a microbial genome, and resynthesize that and get it to express significantly better. In our case, we got about a two order of magnitude bump in the production. We don't always get this, but it's really nice when you do. Now, um, this pointed out that we had limitations in the upstream biosynthetic pathway. And we were using a native biosynthetic pathway to produce a C15 hydrocarbon, farnesyl pyrophosphate, that's native to E. coli and you and me. And in you and me, it's responsible for cholesterol biosynthesis. So we actually went into Saccharomyces and pulled out the pathway that produces cholesterol or ergosterol in uh, Saccharomyces. And we gave E. coli a cholesterol problem by putting in this pathway. And this got us about another two order of magnitude bump in the production. And I'm going through this quickly because it's ancient history. Um, but uh, there are a few lessons to be learned about reprogramming cells for biosynthetic pathways. And I want to just describe a couple of those lessons that we learned along the way. One is that balance in metabolic pathways is extremely important. And, and of course, you all know that. Um, but I want to just point out a couple of problems. Uh, when we were expressing the sesquiterpene synthase to produce the C15 hydrocarbon, uh, if you pull too hard on farnesyl pyrophosphate, you actually rob the cell of a component that's needed for growth and the cells won't grow. But if you pull not hard enough, you actually have a similar problem. And, and that's outlined here. We actually left out the gene completely to really demonstrate this. And as you titrate in mevalonate, an intermediate in this biosynthetic pathway, the cells actually grew more and more poorly. So the, the growth slowed 
or didn't go to as high a level as you titrated in uh, mevalonate, an intermediate in the pathway. And what we discovered along the way is that if you add back in the sesquiterpene synthase and balance its expression, the growth recovered to almost normal levels. And to make a long story short, we found that intermediates in that biosynthetic pathway actually accumulated and were toxic to the cell. They feedback inhibit natural metabolic pathways. And that balance was actually critical because both IPP, DMAP, and FPP were toxic to the cells. But if you balance the pathway perfectly, the cells grow fine and you get high titers of your product. Now, uh, I want to just point out kind of the top part of this pathway because we had some equally uh, disturbing problems with the top part of the pathway. And that is, as we titrated in gene copy number, the cells grew more and more poorly. Now, one of the things we often do when we're building metabolic pathways is we put them on the strongest plasmid we have in the laboratory under the strongest promoter, highest copy plasmid, strongest promoter, ex hoping to express those genes and get a lot of flux through our pathway. And in this particular instance, as we titrated in, had a higher and higher copy number, the cells grew more and more poorly. And the problem with biology is it's very difficult to go in and troubleshoot these potential problems in biosynthetic pathways. Do we have the equivalent in biology of the debugging tools that we have when we're writing software? And, and I would hypothesize the answer is yes, we do have those tools. They're in the form of transcriptomics, proteomics and metabolite analysis. And it's a matter of using these tools to debug these engineered cells. Now, I want to describe some of that work because this is more recent work that appeared in the literature on debugging these metabolic pathways. And the first thing we noticed in this metabolic pathway is that an intermediate in the pathway, HMG-CoA synthase, actually accumulated to very high levels inside the cells. Now, we wanted to know if HMG-CoA itself was toxic or if it was the HMG-CoA synthase that synthesizes that HMG-CoA, if that was toxic. So we made a point mutation in HMG-CoA synthase. This knocked out the activity, but still allowed us to express the gene. So we could test toxicity of the intermediate HMG-CoA or the HMG-CoA synthase, or just the act of producing the protein. It could be that we're just robbing the cells of amino acids that might otherwise be used to synthesize the cells and therefore, the cells aren't growing. And then we did an experiment where we compared the cells that had an active pathway with those that were expressing all of the genes but had an inactive step in the middle so they wouldn't accumulate HMG-CoA with a vector-only control. And then we grew the cells up, took time points, and analyzed the cells using transcriptomics, proteomics, and metabolomics. The first thing we noticed is that fatty acid biosynthesis was vastly upregulated. ACC A and C and Fab B and Fab D were all upregulated in fatty acid biosynthesis. We noticed that the cells were suffering many stresses, oxidative stress, protein misfolding stress, and membrane osmotic stress. And I'll come back to these in just a minute. We noticed, as I noted before, that HMG-CoA accumulated in cells expressing the active pathway, but didn't in cells that weren't expressing that active pathway. The real surprise was malonyl-CoA. It accumulated to a very high level in cells expressing the ha active pathway, but was much lower in cells with the inactive pathway or with the vector-only control. We also noted that we were perturbing fatty acid biosynthesis, so that different fatty acids were accumulating in the membrane. In the cells with the active pathway, saturated fatty acids as a percentage of total fatty acids decreased, and unsaturated fatty acids as a percentage of total fatty acids increased. Now, these are small changes, but they are really substantial in changing the fluidity of the membrane. So putting this all together, we saw that ACC, A, and C were upregulated, malonyl-CoA accumulated inside cells, unsaturated fatty acids increased as a percentage of total, uh, total fatty acids, and saturated fatty acids decreased. A Couple of more pieces of information. Malonyl-CoA and HMG-CoA look a lot alike in their structures. HMG-CoA reductase activity increased when we expressed that enzyme and then decreased. And HMG-CoA accumulated in organisms that produce it natively. And, and this causes an osmotic stress. So if you remember, we saw protein misfolding stress, potentially due to HMG-CoA reductase. 
osmotic stress potentially do to HMG-CoA itself. So here's our hypothesis for what went wrong. We put in the top part of this pathway. HMG-CoA reductase died in its activity in time. It, the enzyme actually ended up in the particulate fraction, unfolded. HMG-CoA accumulated. Because it looks like malonyl-CoA, it gums up FABD. Because FABD is inactive, malonyl-CoA accumulates. But there's no flux through the fatty acid biosynthetic pathway, so the cells feel starved for fatty acids. They upregulate the enzymes and the genes involved in fatty acid biosynthesis, ACC, ANC, and FABB and FABD. And therefore, you get an accumulation of unsaturated fatty acids because FABB pulls them off of the fatty acid biosynthetic cycle before they're fully reduced, and a decrease in saturated fatty acids. So one could predict, then, that you could add saturated fatty acids back, and the cells would recover fine. And that data are shown here. So in blue squares are cells growing with an inactive pathway, and you can see they're growing quite well. When you put in an active pathway, shown in red triangles, the cells don't grow so well. But when you add saturated fatty acids back to those cells that have the active pathway, they recover their growth almost to the cells, the growth of the cells of the inactive pathway. This is not really a great way to produce anti-malarial drugs or biofuels because saturated fatty acids are far too expensive to add to the growth medium. So you have to fix these metabolic pathways. And I want to describe some recent work we've done to try to fix these metabolic pathways. Now, when you think about how we express metabolic pathways in cells, it's, it's actually crazy. We, we express the genes that encode the enzymes on the highest copy plasmids we can find under the strong, control of the strongest promoters. There's no link between the enzymes. We're just filling up the cell with the enzymes and hoping that the metabolic intermediates, the product of one enzyme, finds its way to be the substrate for the next enzyme in the metabolic pathway. There's no connection, so there's loss of intermediates to the bulk. The enzymes freely diffuse about inside the cell. And if one of those intermediates, like HMG-CoA, is toxic to the cells, then you really exacerbate your problem further. What you'd really like to do is tie these enzymes together, much like we put pipes together under our house. The problem is we have no formula for the equivalent of pipe threads on enzymes. There's no standards for how you put enzymes together. If we had that, then we might even be able to connect multiple enzymes together that are rate limiting the flux through that pathway. Now, if you don't have the equivalent of pipe threads, maybe you can hold pipe together like we do with copper pipe. So what I'm showing there are steel pipe. And this, these are what carry natural gas through your house. And those are put together using pipe fittings, threads. But that's not how water generally runs through most people's houses. It runs through copper pipe. And copper pipe are held together with a scaffold, essentially. You put a ring around two pipes that are held together, and you solder those together. So can we come up with the equivalent of a scaffold that will hold enzymes together so that we can shove these enzymes together and get the flux to flow through that metabolic pathway? So this is about the time that John Duber came to my laboratory. Um, he came from Wendell Lim's laboratory, and Wendell Lim works on signaling cascades inside eukaryotic cells. And those signal cascades pa are passed along by uh, phosphorylation, and those enzymes are held on scaffolds. So he said, why can't we take these enzymes in a metabolic pathway and stick them on a scaffold so that the product of one enzyme will just be passed along to the next enzyme in the, on the, sitting on that scaffold? So what that would require is a scaffold that would have very specific binding portions to it, binding domains. And it would require a ligand at the end of those enzymes that would attach specifically to the scaffold. Well, where are we going to find those? Well, why not take them from signal transduction that goes on in eukaryotes, like the GBD, SH3, and PDZ binding domains, and their associated lig ligands? The ligands are peptides, so a few amino acids. And the binding domains are extremely specific for them. And why not take those binding domains and string them together, put some non-structure forming amino acids between them, and encode them on a single gene? So that's what we did. 
we made a construct with 8OB, HMGS, and HMGR with specific peptide ligands at the C terminus. And we encoded the GBD, SH3, and PDZ binding domains in a single gene linked together with non-structure forming amino acids. And the beauty of this system is that if you want to vary one of those enzymes on the scaffold, if for instance you think that HMGR is flux limiting for this pathway, maybe you could put three or five or ten copies on that scaffold and improve the flux through that pathway. Now the question is, what's the right number of copies? How many copies of HMGR, HMGS, and 8OB should you put on that scaffold? So uh, John uh, was, is a really ambitious guy. And he said, well, let's just make all of the combinations and try it. I said, ah, let's not be quite so ambitious. I'm a little lazier. Let's, let's keep 8OB, the first enzyme, in the pathway constant because it's an E. coli enzyme. And let's vary by 1, 2, and 4 the number of copies of HMGS and by 1, 2, and 4 the number of copies of HMGR. Those are yeast enzymes that we're trying to express in E. coli. Maybe those are, are the problem enzymes. So he did that. He built all the scaffolds um, that would do this. And, and by the way, because we're using this synthetic approach, um, the enzymes have their specific ligands on them, and you don't have to change that at all. And then we asked the cells which one of these combinations gives us the highest production level of mevalonate. And it's a little difficult to see, but the one in the middle that had one copy of 8OB, one copy of HMGS, sorry, two copies of HMGS and two copies of HMGR right there in the very middle had a 77-fold improvement in the production of mevalonate, this intermediate in the pathway. Now, is it important to have those enzymes bound to the scaffold? What if they're just floating around inside the cell? Would you still get that same improvement in production? So uh, here's the base case. The enzymes without the ligands, so we're still expressing the enzymes, and we're expressing the scaffold, but they don't have the ligands, so they're not bound to the, to the uh, scaffold. And that's the base case there at D. There's the 77-fold improvement that I showed you earlier, where we've got the ligands now attached to the enzymes, and we're producing the scaffold. Now, what if you titrate off one of those enzymes by putting a competitor with the same ligand? In this case, green fluorescent protein expressed that has the same ligand as HMGR. So it will compete HMGR off of the scaffold. How does that affect the flux? Well, you can see we got a 25-fold it, we only now have a 25-fold improvement over the base case, no ligands. It dropped the flux by three-fold. And if you express that GFP to an even higher level, you push the flux down more. So binding to the scaffold is essential to get the flux through the, the appropriate uh, flux through the pathway. And one to two to two was the right copy number for the enzymes bound onto this scaffold. Now, in essence, we've built standard connections that we can use for any biosynthetic pathway. And in fact, we've done this with other pathways. We got really lucky in this case and got a 77-fold improvement, but we've shown improvements with other pathways. And if you write to us, we'll actually send you those scaffolds. Uh, now, through further optimizations, we and our colleagues at Am uh, Amaris have improved these organisms substanti to substantially higher production levels. Now, I want to talk about specifically now about producing biofuels and specific biofuels. And as I said, it's in our case a matter of using this host that we've already built and swapping in genes that will encode for biofuels. So I'm going to talk about two isoprenoid esters that can be used as diesels and short-chain alcohols that can be used as biogasoline replacements. Now, the first molecules I want to talk about are these short, these medium-chain alcohols. And uh, the one in particular is isopentanol. It has great energy content, about 96% of that of gasoline. It's got a very high octane number, which means it could be a great uh, gasoline replacement. Um, and that means it can easily be blended with gasoline at high percentages. 
Now, in order to produce that, we need to produce it from IPP and DMAP to C5 hydrocarbons that are produced naturally inside cells. So we need to take off those pyrophosphates and we need to reduce it fully to 3-methyl uh, butanol or isopentanol. Now, the first step is to find a phosphatase. Now, I had told you about troubleshooting inside the cell where we found that accumulation of IPP and DMAP was actually toxic to the cells and they didn't grow when they accumulated it, but when you had uh, a sesquiterpene synthase, they don't accumulate and the cells grow fine. Well, we could use that toxicity of accumulation of IPP and DMAP to actually screen for phosphatases that would dephosphorylate IPP and DMAP and form the alcohol. It just relieves the accumulation of those. Where do we go find that? Well, we made a library of Bacillus subtilis. It turns out that some strains of Bacillus subtilis actually make isoprene. So we went in with a <clears throat> library from Bacillus subtilis, pulled out a phosphatase that actually relieves the toxicity of the accumulation of IPP and DMAP and expressed that and got fairly good production of isopentanol. We've since gone through libraries of phosphatases and found even better ones that have substantially improved production. The next step, of course, is to find a reductase, and you can actually go in through uh, and do similar screening. In this case, we screened through an enzyme family called Old Yellow Enzyme and found a series of enzymes that would actually do the reduction and do it quite well. Now, we don't have to stop at producing the alcohol. We can actually esterify these and produce esters that might be great biodiesels. And I'll talk about that in a little more detail. Now, the beauty of the system that we've developed is unlike esters that are made from biodiesel, we can actually move the ester anywhere we want to on that chain by producing either component on either side. So we could produce short chain fatty acids and esterify them to the alcohols, uh, the isoprenoid alcohols. I just showed you that we could produce. Now, I want to talk a little bit more about some of these biodiesels. If you think about what kind of biodiesels you might want to produce, you have to consider cetane number. So cetane number is the equivalent of octane number for gasoline, except cetane number is for diesel fuel. And you want cetane numbers that are in the 50 to 60 range. And these that I've actually uh, put boxes around are some of the ideal esters that would make great biodiesel replacements. Now, we'd also like to go in and produce some straight chains. Now, uh, if you think about, we've produced these branch chain molecules. They're great uh, for keeping uh, fuel from freezing, but uh, a lot of diesel and jet fuel is actually straight chain alkanes, and we need a source for these. Now, I've been talking about the isoprenoid biosynthetic pathway, which is ideal for producing these branch chain molecules. The fatty acid biosynthetic pathway is actually ideal for producing straight chains. Now, the fortunate part of fatty acid biosynthesis is that cells produce a lot of fatty acid. The unfortunate part is that they incorporate every last drop of them into their lipids and waste very few of them. This is the fatty acid biosynthetic pathway um, in, in very um, simple form that E. coli uses. They make fatty acyl ACPs from acetyl-CoA, and these get incorporated into lipids. And there's very little fatty acid that goes outside the cell. But the cells can actually grow on fatty acids, either as a carbon source or incorporate those into the membrane. Now, if you incorporate a thioesterase, and this has been shown years ago, um, that you could take a plant thioesterase, and you could actually release fatty acids and get E. coli to produce free fatty acids and, and shunt those into the medium. You could then turn those into esters, which are great biodiesels, alcohols, which are actually a substrate for the chemicals industry, or aliphatic hydrocarbons directly. Now, we wanted to try to produce biodiesels directly inside E. coli, the full biodiesel molecule. Unfortunately, as I said, E. coli produces very few free fatty acids. But if you add in a plant thioesterase, you can actually get E. coli to produce measurable, not high levels, of free fatty acids. The reason they won't produce high levels is because they reincorporate them back into the membrane and take them back in. So you actually have to go in and you have to knock out 
the steps in fatty acid, uh, 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 fatty acid degradation in order to get the cells to accumulate more. And you can get them to improve the production by about another fourfold. But what you really want are esters. Fatty acids aren't very useful themselves. You could either fully reduce them to an alkane, or you could make them into an ester. The challenge is that that requires chemistry, and chemistry takes more money, and that makes the cost of your fuel go up. So how about if you produce both the alcohol and the acid inside the cell and do the esterification inside the cell directly? Well, Lonnie Ingram has been working on ethanol biosynthesis for many years. He developed this pathway that takes pyruvate, goes through acetaldehyde to ethanol. It works very efficiently. You can incorporate it into E. coli and get high levels of ethanol. Now the question is, can you actually esterify the fatty acid that you're producing and make fatty esters? And the answer is, yes, you can. Yes, we can. Uh, we can add in a uh, acyl transferase, and this was actually shown by uh, Steinbuchel and his colleagues in, in Germany, where they uh, added in uh, an uh, ATFA, which is an acyl transferase, and they could esterify fatty acids. This is the first time that it's been shown you can actually do it with the alcohol and actually esterify the fatty acids directly. But you get low production levels, so you have to actually increase the production of the fatty acyl-CoA in order to get high levels of the fatty acid ethyl ester. Now, just to show you that we can produce substantial amounts of this, it's actually kind of difficult to see. Um, this is a culture of cells um, that uh, was producing uh, the fatty acid ethyl ester. And if you could see it, you'd see that there was oil floating to the top. You centrifuge down the cells, they actually sh push the uh, fatty acid ethyl ester outside the cells. And this is uh, uh, a uh, micrograph of the cells. You can actually see these oil blebs, which are biodiesel directly, mixed in with the E. coli. And it's non-toxic. You can add it in in huge quantities, and it's completely non-toxic to the cells. The cells push it out. We don't know how they get it out of the cells. We suspect that they may use one of the pumps they use to import fatty acids but they actually push it outside the cells and it's completely non-toxic. So what this gives you is a nearly purification-free method for producing biodiesel. Cells produce the fatty acid ethyl esters, they push them outside the cells, you turn off the impeller, they float to the top, you put them in your gas tank. It's not quite that easy, but it's close. <laughs> now, We'd also like to be able to produce aliphatic hydrocarbons. We'd like to produce alkanes directly. So work by Harry Beller at JBay, has, he's gone in and looked for genes that in organisms are known to produce alkenes and alkanes. Uh, and in this case, he went to Micrococcus luteus, cloned out the only ABCD genes from that, and found that they use a rather interesting mechanism to produce alkenes. They actually take two fatty acyl CoAs, uh, they decarboxylate one of them, ligate them together, essentially, and you get an alkene as a result. And you can see some of this that's just been published recently in the Journal of Bacteriology. Now, just in closing, uh, I want to talk about taking this one step further. So uh, all of you know that, or most of you know that, we want to use biomass and turn that into our fuel. And, and biomass, of course, you have to grow that up. You have to uh, ship it off someplace to be uh, pre-treated. Uh, the pre-treatment extracts the cellulose, the sugar-containing part, and the hemicellulose, the five-carbon sugar-containing part of the plant, from the lignin. The lignin gets burned. Of course, if we were producing ethanol, we'd use that as heat to distill ethanol. But since we're not going to be producing ethanol for fuel anymore, we can use that actually to generate electricity. But then we've got to break down that cellulose and hemicellulose into the component sugars, the five and six carbon sugars, get the cells to take that up and produce the fuel. And that means we've got to add enzymes, hemicellulases and cellulases to break down those sugar polymers. It would be so much easier if we could just get our fuel producing microbe to express the genes that encode cellulases and hemicellulases, ex export those from the cells, break down those polymers into sugars, and turn those sugars into fuels. So can we do it? 
yes, we can. So this is an example uh, uh, from Greg Bukinski in my laboratory where he took two enzymes, uh, an endoxylinase and a beta xylosidase. Uh, these enzymes essentially break down uh, xylan into xylodextrins, and then the beta xylosidase breaks it down into uh, uh, xylose that can be imported into the cell and turned into fuel. And this shows the growth of E. coli in minimal medium expressing these two genes um, and growing on ionic liquid extracted switchgrass. So he's taken swollen ionic liquid extracted switchgrass, which is enriched heavily in cellulose and hemicellulose, added E. coli that's expressing these two genes. And by the way, the endoxylinase has an export tag on it so that it's exported from the cell. And the cells grow on this as a carbon source. Can they produce improved fuels? So then we incorporated these genes into our fatty acid ethyl ester, biodiesel producing E. coli. And again, here shows the growth of that organism uh, expressing uh, the xylanases. And you can see it grows much better with than without. And we get a substantial improvement in the production of fuels. So we can take, in this case, uh, hemicellulose and turn it into fuel directly. So I'd like to thank the people in the fuel synthesis division at uh, JBay who did this work and in my laboratory. And I'd like to thank the US Department of Energy for funding this work and you for your time and attention. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. I was just wondering, have you used your uh, scaffolding technology for the fatty acid work that you did? Um, we haven't yet, and actually, uh, I think it could be really interesting with these um, fatty acid synthases, uh, the type 2 fatty acid synthase, where you have uh, completely individual components, unlike the type 1s, which are all linked together, um, and essentially on uh, a nature-built scaffold. So I think it'd be really interesting to compare. And what I didn't really talk about in any detail is that there's um, a lot of recycling of CoAs and the possibility uh, that we're getting a lot of feudal cycles in our fatty acid biosynthesis. And by putting them on scaffolds, we might actually reduce that. So um, this is something we're thinking about, might do, um, but we think it might improve production. Um. Have you considered putting chlorophyll in E. coli instead of uh, <laughs> relying on plants? No, in other words, <laughs> uh, how about uh, algae? Uh, uh, is there a group working on that uh, within the DOE system? We are not working on algae um, with Bioenergy Research Center funding. Um, that wasn't in uh, uh, the mandate. Um, I think it's a, a, an interesting possibility. I have a few doubts about algae, um, which I won't express here, at least not without some ethanol. Um, uh, but I think it could be really interesting, and I think we should have active research going on in the algae area, because who knows? I, I, at this point, I think anything's fair game. Um, but you know, the nice thing about synthetic biology and building pathways in a modular way is that hopefully you can swap these to a certain extent from organism to organism, or at least having standard connections will allow you to do it a little bit faster than what we normally would. Uh, news from the Lilly uh, Brookhaven National Lab. Um, have you also considered using oxotrophic microorganisms, like for instance, uh, alkaligenous uh, eutropha, which was also sequenced at the, by the JGI, that's a very good producer of bioplastics, and to knock out those genes and replace them uh, by genes for the production of biodiesel. I, I think that's a really interesting idea. I mean, I, th I think there are a number of microbes um, that will actually be better in industrial process than E. coli and Saccharomyces cerevisiae. We work on those because, um, one, they're easier. Um, and two, we can do a lot of the engineering um, that we want to do. 
Um, I look at a place like JBay as doing a lot of the proof of concept um, and really showing that these things, kinds of things can be done, that you can get an organism to um, break down a, a, a polymer, uh, import the sugar, turn it into a fuel, and then companies can license the technology from us and put in whatever bug they want. But I, I think there are, are, could be some really great microbes out there, maybe like uh, Ralstonia eutropha, that, that would be great as a producer. Dan. Question and a comment. The comment had to do with the algae question. There is an Office of Biomass Programs in the U.S. Department of Energy that is carrying out some algal research and our office is in conversation with them. So yes, there is research going on. It's not being done by us, but there is some at DOE. Question is this. What do you think the theoretical limits are of pushing the metabolism and the met metabolic processes of a microbe? Well, I mean, we know what, you know, you can do a carbon balance, uh, you can do a redox balance, you can figure out the maximum theoretical amount of carbon that you can turn, uh, uh, of, of fuel that you can get from carbon source. Um, so we do those calculations all the time. Um, if you look at some of the best ethanol producers, they're in the 90% of theoretical yield, which means that not a lot of sugar is going to producing the bug. Um, now, how you do those calculations and you know the amount of slot back you have back into the, the fermentation tank of, of microbes, that all has to go into it. But we know what we can get with ethanol. Now, how, you know, what can we get with some of these advanced biofuels? And, and right now it's substantially less. We're at about 7%. Um, we'd like to get to about 30% of theoretical maximum. Um, I figure that's probably good enough for us at this stage. Um, the one thing we have going for us is that the fu fuels have higher energy density. So you need less um, uh, efficiency in converting your carbon source into your final product. But clearly, you want to get as close to theoretical maximum as possible. I, and I think the only way we're going to get there quickly is by having a good tool set, metabolic models, um, analysis, flux analysis, et cetera, that can all work together to engineer these pathways. I read that the, uh, the new biofab is being housed at JBay, and you yes. said that uh, we could write to you and you'd send us the, the construct, but maybe we can just order it online. I wonder if you could say a bit about what the BioFab is and what are the plans for yes, the future. Yes, so that's a great question. The National Science Foundation um, funded uh, a new BioFab uh, that will be housed uh, at Emory Station East, fourth floor, that also houses uh, the Joint Bioenergy Institute. And the idea is to build components that are standardized, well characterized, that will be open source, freely <laughs> available to everyone. Um, and so that this will allow the biotechnology industry to grow much like the microelectronics industry and the chemicals industry. It's a very modest facility that we're starting out with, um, but uh, it'll give us the ability to do proof of concept. Um, the idea is that you, we wouldn't even send you the components. You'd go on, you'd look much like you would, say, take a TTL handbook and look at the descriptions of a microprocessor or in those days a transistor. Um, you'd see the description, the input-output characteristics, and you'd have the gene sequence, and you'd send off to wherever your favorite DNA synthesis house and have them synthesize the gene for you, and it should perform as we specify from the biofab. So stay tuned, that's coming. Uh, it sounds like you're trying to put us out of business. Um, the NSF does support us, uh, a network of collections, uh, bioshacks, if you will, and uh, uh, everybody should encourage their colleagues to deposit materials in them. There's no profit margin in, in these collections. Um, and uh, if you go as far as encouraging journals to m demand that people deposit things, why then these materials will be available to everyone and uh, available at, at very limited cost. Thank you. Actually, we're not trying to put you out of business. We think uh, these collections are extremely important. We use them all the time. And uh, I send all of our stuff that we publish to Adgene, actually, to uh, be shipped out. So. Uh, I, I think 
there's not, we're not trying to replace the collections. That won't happen anytime <coughs> soon. What we're trying to do is make biology easier to engineer uh, and more reproducible. Um, and I think there's an important place for both the collections and the biofab. Hi. Hi. Um, you, it seems like you spend a lot of time um, uh, trying to work around the, the uh, trying to work around crosstalk and not host regulation when you um, are sort of building these systems and trying to get natural regulatory systems to do things they weren't designed to do. This may be a naive question, but has anyone tried reconstructing these pathways in in vitro transcription systems? Sure. Um, there are people like Jim Schwartz at Stanford who uh, use um, in vitro synthesis to look at metabolic pathways and try to understand rate limiting steps. And I think that has a really important place to play. In the end, though, it's got to go into a microbe because you're not going to have in vitro synthesis of fuels in an economically viable way. Um, the only way to do that is to have the catalyst build itself, essentially, so have a, a microbe. But I think we can learn a lot by doing this in vitro and, and figure out dosing and things like that, um, rate limiting steps. I have sort of the opposite question, which is, um, so all your approaches describe using engineering. Um, and to what extent do you think selection is going to be a useful tool in in approaches that do use engineering as a starting point? I think it's extremely important. And that's the one, I think, advantage that biology has over silicon is that uh, we can select uh, for what we want. But you have to have function before you can do that, right? And what we'd like to do, I think, in the ideal world is get as close as possible by design and then use screening and selection to get the rest of, rest of the way there to fine tune. You know, right now that's playing a really large role and sometimes even just getting a function is a really hard thing. So if we can use the two in, the co in combination, I think that will just be absolutely ideal for engineering biology. Okay, I want to thank Jay.